Well, uh, yeah. Wow, bright lights. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm in town to visit um, Morgan Stanley's office here, our office in Budapest, and visit some universities. And they invited me to give a talk here. And I'm going to talk about one of the more recent developments of C++ and one I'm rather excited about. Uh, basically, I'm going to say a little bit about what um, generic programming is <coughs> and how it's supported in C++. And um, it was interesting to hear from, from the space program. Um, there's some C++ on Mars and in the deep space program and in the um, generic, in, in, in the uh, machine learning stuff, they're using TensorFlow. So I felt a little bit proud. It's nice. I can't match the big uh, numbers and the great pictures. Most of my stuff is just plain code, but it was really nice to hear it. Um, basically, the way I value programming is through what you do with it, like the space program. It's really cool. And there's all kinds of other things that's being done with, with C++, from the, the biggest systems to basically the smallest. Uh, my background was in distributed systems. I still work on that. Uh, there's a distributed system with wheels. Uh, so um, what, what I'm talking about is actually, it's, it's deep in the code, but it's in code that does interesting things. And so when people talk about generic programming, they always start with wanting a parameterized type. You don't want just a vector of doubles or a vector of integers. You want a vector of t that where t is something you choose. And once you get from there, of course, you want to sort your vector and do other obvious operations on them, uh, find something in them and such. And so the minute you get parameterized types, uh, templates, as they're called in C++, uh, you get uh, algorithms for doing it. And as soon as you get algorithms, you want more flexibility. And therefore, you need to parameterize your algorithms with other algorithms. In particular, for instance, here with sort, you want to parameterize it with a sorting criteria. And basically, from that piece of logic, which most people get through in about a day max from having seen nothing, you get the whole problem of how to get generic programming, how to use it, how to support it. And we want this to be uh, simple, elegant, and efficient. And by efficient, I mean the usual uh, C++ criteria, not a byte, not a cycle more than you could handwrite it in uh, low-level stuff. That's where the constraint is. OK, so generic programming is something we've been talking about for a long time in the context of C++. Most of it came from Alex Stefanov uh, back in the 80s. Uh, he was really interesting in, in generic algorithms that you get from generalizing from concrete examples, preserving performance. Um, again, this being C++, we are not interested in just being able to do it elegantly. We want to be able to afford to do it elegantly. Um, and my aim really is to eliminate as many as the differences between generic and non-generic code, because we are pretty good at non-generic code, and generic code is something that's considered strange and difficult by a lot of people, and I don't think it is, and it certainly shouldn't be. And I wanted to escape from the foundation libraries like vectors and maps and such into application code, and I'm seeing that happening today. So basically, I want gener generic programming to be just programming. And that's what I'm uh, talking about today. So basically, I, I started wanting generic programming back in the 80s. There's a paper by me from 81 explaining why we need generic programming and how we can do it with macros. I had the right problem. I got the very bad solution. If you try to do generic programming with macros, it doesn't scale, it's not efficient enough, it's not elegant enough. It's, it's just a very bad idea. However, it's the right problem. So in 87, I uh, sort of 
looked at the criteria, I wanted something that extremely general and flexible. I'd learned a long time ago that if I built something that could only do what I could imagine, then it's not general enough. A group like this can imagine many more things than I can, and I must serve a larger group. And I wanted the usual zero overhead uh, principle. In particular, I wanted to compete with C arrays for higher level uh, containers. And since C arrays and pointers is the absolute fastest you can run on hardware, this is the hard criteria. And uh, I got that. And of course, I wanted well-specified interfaces. I was the one that put uh, um, function prototype into C and such. So I, I knew the value of interfaces. And a lot of what we do with design has to do with designing good interfaces. And well, there was three criteria. And um, I couldn't do all three. I asked around. Nobody else could either. So um, I've been looking for a way of specifying the interfaces well, because out of those three, I had to pick the first two uh, for C++. And I've been looking ever since. And now um, I can actually explain how uh, this is done. And basically, this is the, some of the fundamental um, design criteria for C++. Generality, zero overhead, and good interfaces. And so if you go back in time, there was a time this was C. You define a square root. You can't say what its uh, argument is. So if you call it with two, it crashes because it requires a double and two is an integer. Just like if you give it a string, it gives a crash. And uh, if you get the type right, everything's fine and people are happy. This is not good enough. This is just asking for trouble. And so, of course, we added um, uh, the argument types there, so that when you say square root of two, it can figure out that two can be converted to a double, and we can do the job. Fine, simple, trivial. We've learned this in school. So that is fine, but this is one of the major improvements of um, C. And I want to do a similar trick to C++ when it comes to generic code. So basically, since uh, 88 or thereabouts, in C++, we've been able to do generic programming using templates. And we can have something, say, sort. Um, it takes two random iterators that gives a range. And uh, it says that the random access iterator is a type. That's all we know about it. We don't know what type it is. This is, creates trouble. So here, I have a vector of integers. And I can sort a vector of integers. We know how to do that. There's a definition of what a sort requires. It requires random access iterators, and it requires elements that can do less than. OK, so that is fine. We try with lists. It doesn't work. We try with um, a vector begin and a list end. This will not work. And uh, we can try and sort a vector of s's. That will not work, because s doesn't have a less than operator. The errors that we get here are spectacularly bad. This is about the worst error messages you ever saw. It's the C++ equivalent to the core dumps, the segment failures you got out of ancient uh, C. So we have to do better. And um, one thing to think about is, is, is why are we here? And the point is that templates were really great. And they were really, really useful. They got the flexibility. Uh, they get type safety, but too late. That's why the error messages are bad. The compiler finds that you've made a mistake, but it can't tell you what you, it doesn't know what you are trying to do. Therefore, I can just say what the mistake was, not how you got to it. And um, so there's type safety, specialization is really good, and runtime performance was spectacularly good if you'd use it right. And they have huge flaws. The syntax is ugly. It uses duck typing. If it works, it works. If it walks like a duck and it quacks, it's a duck. And if it isn't, you get the error messages. And overloading doesn't work well. And code organization is different from ordinary code. It's pretty bad. And the combination is slow. So basically, we need to address this problem because despite these flaws, this is popular. It's used widely. It's used important code. So it's worthwhile solving the problem. And so 
basically the solution is like for ordinary functions um, is to say sort take something that's sortable and that sortable there is called a concept uh, Alex Stefanov uh, named them like that so I'm using that name and so we have to define sortable in such a way that the compiler can understand it that is we have to keep put in the hands of the program or the ability to define what sortable means we know what sortable means, by the way. It's in the international standard. You just read the right sections, but compilers don't write, read uh, manual sections, and by and large, programmers do either. So once we have defined sortable, we can say sort that vector, and it will say is a vector sortable, and it is. It has all the criteria. Sort a list? No, it will say sortable. Uh, doesn't have subscripting, it's not a random access iterator, and it will actually give that error message. That's what it will tell you. And uh, I can say sort of that vector of S's, it doesn't have less than, it will tell you that vectors of S's are not sortable because um, it doesn't have a less than. And I'm not talking about science fiction. This has been shipping as part of GCC for about three years. It's in fairly serious uh, production use in quite a few places and by the way what you're seeing here will be in C++ 20 um, which will uh, be next year and all the major implementation should do this by the end of next year by the time we actually have that standard uh, so basically once we've got this there's interesting things we can do like I told you we couldn't sort lists because lists don't have random access so how would you do it? You just define the sort for something that list like, and the way you can sort a list is very easy. You just copy it into a vector, sort the vector, and copy the elements back again. That's usually the most efficient way of doing it. And now we can sort the vector of integers. That's fine because that works like we defined it and the way the standard does. And we can sign sort a list. All load resolution cuts in. It picks my list here, not the general one, and so that's fine too. And we can still not sort the um, vector of uh, S's because S's don't have less than, so it'll refuse that. But you can see how things get more flexible, and I don't have to declare a hierarchy of things because what happens is that we look at sortable, we look at lists, we look at the definitions, we realize that for a vector, we can use the one with the most constraints, so we do it. Lists will only do lists and not vectors, so we pick that one. It's all done automatically through the type system, and it, it works rather nicely. So what is a concept? How do we define concepts? Basically, concepts are compile time predicates. Predicate is something, you ask a question, you get yes or no, and that's it. So we ask T, is T a forward iterator? Yes or no? Um, equality comparable? Can a T be compared with a U? Yeah uh, or no, but we can ask these questions at compile time, use it to resolve problems about which functions to call and what we can do with operations. So basically that's, that's all there is to it. It's really simple and it's quite efficient. There's no Compile, there's no runtime overhead, zero, zip. And there is very little compile time overhead too. As a matter of fact, it compiles faster than workarounds. Um, things, things like this uh, compiles faster than workarounds and runs as fast as it could possibly do. Uh, so we have to learn to use this stuff well. This is new, so people think it's scary, difficult, slow, all the usual things. It's not true, but we have to learn how to use it well. Um, and basically, we've always had concepts. You look into the C manual, you look into the original KNRC, and it says integral types are things with these properties. Um, arithmetic types are things with these properties. So it was in the manual, and it's actually in the compiler. This is not new. And if we look at the STL, it talks about iterators, it talks about sequences, containers. They are there. They just weren't in the code. We need to get it in the code so that we can use it. Similarly, graphs have standard concepts. Math has standard concepts. We want to put 
that those things that we know, which we in some cases have known for hundreds of years, into the code so we can use it. And the, uh, the language support is, is what, what this is about. And uh, so one way of looking at things is that a type is something that specifies what we can do to an object. We can do it uh, Im implicitly, we can do it explicitly. I mean, some things are in the compiler and the standard, some we specify it for our user-defined types. And it uh, specifies also how our object is laid out in memory. Now, a concept specifies how things can be used, but it doesn't specify layout. Therefore, we can apply it to a larger set of things than we can apply a type to. So, float and double are different types because they're laid out different, they've got different ranges, but a set of operations are the same, so they're the same concept. And so, basically, um, my idea is eventually we'll get to the point where we can use a type exactly the way we use a, um, sorry, we can use a concept exactly the way we use a type except for creating objects. And that should be the whole difference. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. So have an example. This is not just for, um, for function call. Here I have a, a concept defined to be a, a thing is a, t, the ins, a t is an integer if it is the same type as an integer. That's about the simplest concept you could think about that actually does something. So I have defined here the concept of an integer. And I can define uh, something that is supposed to be an integer, that integer auto x1 says, deduce the type of x1 from its initializer. The initializer is an int, so it's an int. Check that it meets the requirements integer. Yeah, it's an int, it works. Uh, I can then take x2, it really is an integer. And I can add things and make sure that the result is still integers. I can add the plain old integers and I get exactly the same. I can define functions that takes types. I can take, define functions that takes concept. So void f2 integer auto ref. Um, that's actually a template that will take anything that is an integer and it'll instantiate the appropriate implementations for different types. So this would work for your integer type that is big int and is very different from uh, integer, but it'll all work. So one of the things we have found in C++ is people all use auto so that it's hard to read the code, so we can use concepts to resolve that. As a matter of fact, the use of the word auto there is, in my opinion, redundant and we shouldn't have to do it, but the standards committee uh, decided that um, well, we couldn't handle that, so it had to be special syntax, and that became auto. Okay, so let's um, see how we, uh, how we define concepts. Uh, these title slides are just to give me time to breathe and to show off some applications of uh, C++. Um, so to define a concept, the first way we do it is we define a concept in terms of other concepts. It's exactly the way we write functions, we call other functions. So to define uh, sortable that I used before, um, so it has to be, uh, there has to be a sequence with a begin and an end for, for cheese, um, and there has to be random access for that, um, that type. And the values that you point to with this uh, iterator, which is what it must be to be defining a sequence with random access. Uh, the value types has to be swappable because sort like to swap, and it has to be able to compare value types with less than. This is not brain surgery, it's not rocket science, it is just what it says in the standard. Interestingly enough, English is not actually as good as saying this as C++, so it takes about a page to say in English. Uh, this is how you define it. And so when you start out with concepts, you pick out a lot of the standard ones from the C++ 20 standards. You find them in concepts, you find them in memory, you find them in ranges, you find them in random 
uh, it's, it's all over the next generation standard library. Uh, if you really have to go down to the nitty gritty and write code directly on the language, this is a bit like writing functions without calling other functions. It's always a bit messier and more, uh, more difficult. But basically, I want to def define equality comparable. And here, I'm defining it for a single type. I could defi define it for two types. But basically, I use what's called requires expressions. This is basically something that gives a usage pattern that says, to be equality comparable, a type T must be able to compare two Ts and get a bool. And it must be able to compare it with not equals also and get a bool. That, that's it. Um, again, uh, quite simple, and um, you can take care of mixed mode arithmetic and, and such. So you can define equality comparable for a T and a U, which is actually what is done in the standard. One thing to be worth mentioning here, concepts are not just types of types. You can think about a concept with a single argument as a type of a type if you want to. But most concepts actually take more arguments because most of our algorithms takes more than one argument type. And therefore, the connection between two arguments has to be expressed. That'll be expressed with a, at least a two argument concept and type of type model of things break down at this point. Um, if you want to write things at scale, it gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, here's the sequence uh, definition. Um, so it says there has to be a value type. There has to be an iterator of type. Um, begin has to give the iterator. End has to give the iterator. And uh, the iterator has to be an input iterator. And the value type of um, T has to be the same as the iterator's value type. Ah. Anyway, so that's about as complicated as it gets. I mean, I don't expect all of you to, to get this. You've only had a quarter of an hour. But this is, this is not difficult. Think of the code you're writing and looking at every day. This is, this is fairly simple. So um, one thing that we learn for practice is that just like when you write a function, you don't get it right the first time. Similarly, you define a concept, you're not going to get it right the first time. And so partial and uh, incomplete uh, concepts are useful. It checks a set of requirements, even if that set of requirements is not the full set that you absolutely need. And so you start out with something that's a good approximation of what you want, and then you learn and, and you refine it. That's good. And also incomplete partial uh, concepts that checks only part of a set of requirements are very useful as building blocks for, for, for other things. Um, okay, so for defining concepts, um, when you want to use it, some people start putting requires clauses on functions. That gives ad hocery. It, it gives functions that are defined in terms of just a set of expressions. We don't have a name for them. We can't think about them straight, and they're all different. Don't do that. That is a code smell. I'm now getting into the point where the fact that we have three or four years of experience of using this is that I can tell that one stinks. Don't do it. Um, and I know that because people have tried, and it didn't work too well. And so requires, requires is ugly. People have suggested, why don't you make it pretty? Why should I make a common bug pretty? No, it's bad. Um, let's try, we start in the beginning, we say addable. People invent addable all the time. And it's something that you can add, and you can increment, and you can copy, and you can do a T of zero. That is at least much better than just saying that you have A plus B. Um, if you have A plus B, you, you very soon get to uh, have a more complete concept that actually sticks uh, more closely to this. Here, by the way, we just eliminated the uh, concatenation of strings, which is a very different thing from, uh, from addition. So this is why that thing is, is actually bad. It's a code smell. 
it allows things we really don't want to allow. It was supposed to be arithmetic, it isn't, we can do that. And basically, it's, it's better to, to do higher level things um, that, than, than just addable or subtractable and such. Built up to the point where you have a semantics. The mathematicians have been here. This is where you get the monoids, the rings, the vector spaces and such. You will get there eventually. And hopefully, once you start writing the code, somebody will have been there and gone to the library for you. This is why I'm saying use libraries, just like when you write code. Um, defining concepts, um, yeah, I said that. Most concepts are actually um, multi-argument. There's a forward iterator and a predicate. That's what we require for the standard library function, uh, find if. And in the standard library, there's a callable um, concept that specifies that you have to have a predicate over the value types of the iterator when you go through find if. And we can go much further. Here's, uh, here's merge from the standard library. And uh, the first guess looks like that. It's pretty ugly. I mean, you can see down the bottom, there's merge. That's the way it's defined. It takes two uh, forward iterators, then it takes two other forward iterators to defend the other thing that you're merging, and then a place to put the results. That means we have three types. Four has to be a forward iterator. Four, two has to be an operator, a forward iterator. Out has to be an output iterator, and we have to be able to assign to the output iterator. We have to compare it. This is quite a mouthful. And you find that there are quite a few merge algorithms. So you, once you have written this three times, you get tired. And so you start defining higher level concept like mergeable. Mergeable just says that to be mergeable, you take three types and it has the proper things. And we can now define our uh, merge function rather briefly. Again, the value of libraries that encapsulate our knowledge about a domain. The idea, the reason it's called a concept is that it's going to formalize the fundamental concepts of a domain. And that's what I'm doing right here. And uh, let's see. Um, there's some technicalities here that we always get to. Uh, one thing that people would like would be to have perfect checking of templates up front so that you can write a template definition and make sure that it, it really works. And so we would like to do something like find, and you write the application of find, and there's a problem there. First equals first plus one will not work for a forward iterator. Forward iterator has plus plus. You can't say plus one, you can't say plus two, you can't say plus 10. That's not something you can do to a forward iterator. So the question is, should we catch this? A lot of us thought, yeah, obviously, we should do that. And then we noticed, one, it was hard. We could do it, but it was hard. And two, if we stop that, we stop things like instrumentation, debug statements, um, in, um, statistics gathering, you name it. People always put lots of extra stuff into generic code so that they can actually instrument their code. And if you checked the definition so that you only used the properties that was defined in the uh, concept, you'd have to change your concept. You'd have to change your interface each time you change the, um, the instrumentation. If you try to debug a purely functional uh, program, you will f find that problem. And so we decided that we are going to leave some errors till instantiation time where they will be caught. Early checking will catch misuses of the algorithm specified with concepts early at the call point with good error messages. And if you make mistakes in the implementation, if the implementer makes mistakes, then uh, the errors will come late. Some implementers don't particularly like that, but 
uh, people who actually want to use the code want the instrumentation, they want the debuggability, and we decided to uh, side with the users. There's many more users than there's implementers. Um, and so that's why not. And we can actually do this, and we can actually use uh, some of the techniques in, in C++ to actually get definition checking for specific type that we want. We can simply say the range should work for my type. Since uh, concepts like uh, range are a compile time predicate, I can use a static assert to just test that uh, ranges of my type works that equality comparable, I can compare my type with foo. Um, my algorithm will work, my other algorithm will work something else. So uh, we can do that. Um, so just to, to, to wrap up really, uh, there's a lot of history to this. This didn't come out of, of nothing. Um, uh, I, I started in, in 79 with macros um, Alex worked with something he called uh, algebraic structures in um, in 81. Templates didn't come till uh, 88. So the work on generic programming and concepts actually predates templates. And then there's a long kind of history. Some of you know about the fiasco with concepts in um, C++ OX. We just got them wrong and, and pulled them. Uh, it's good not to uh, accept the the bad stuff. And since 14, you've been able to use them if you run GCC, and now it's in uh, C20. Uh, using concepts, <sighs> basically, the main purpose of concepts is to improve your designs and that improves reliability and maintainability. And a key part of that is actually overloading so that you can pick the right algorithm out of a set of algorithms. And algorithms, in the way I'm using the word here, are templatized code. And um, it's, uh, I, I'm beginning to feel that it, it's like the old, um, the old templates, it's like writing in old C before we had user-defined types, before we had uh, uh, proper argument checking. It's, this, it's that kind of magnitude of change. And I remember the days where we put t uh, function argument checking into C. There was about 10 years where people were complaining it was too complicated and too dangerous. It's hard to imagine these days. And I'm hearing all the same arguments about concepts now. It's going to change the way we think about things. Uh, overloading is, impo is important. We can do things, we can, we can hack around it, just like we could hack around things in, in, in C, but it simplifies code a lot. Here's the classic example of an advance. Um, if you advance a forward iterator, you must go step for step. There, 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 there. This is slow, but you can do it to a list. Um, if you advance something that has a random access, you just go over there. So this is the difference between an ON and an O1 algorithm. This actually matters. And uh, with concepts, we can do that. I have here a vector of strings and a list of strings. So if I take an iterator to, uh, to the vector of um, strings, I can advance it two in one jump. Would have been more impressive if I said 100, but that's immaterial. For a list, I have to go one at a time. The point is that the overload system will figure this out, and it will use the fast one for vector, and it will use the slow one for, um, for, for the uh, list. So a lot of the algorithms that we have <coughs> elaborately done uh, and bug-ridden will work it out. The system just works out what you pick. Um, <coughs> And we simplify the design here. This is for people who, has written, uh, who, who, who have been writing code with uh, enable if and such. Uh, you, you get really messy things. We would like to write um, what I have up there. I have a smart pointer, and uh, you can only get a, um, 
an arrow operator if the type is a, a class, uh, the, the thing you point to. Um, and here you have the example with a pair. A pair is convertible to a pair of other types as both types can be converted to it. I mean, so this is fairly simple provided you have concepts. I'm using concept is class. I am using convertible. They are in the standard library. This is the way we can express this. And the punchline here is this is what you'll have to do to implement that today in C++ 17. And this is what you get in 20. That is not exactly pretty. This is expert level stuff. It's headache inducing. Uh, I think I'm not going to explain it to you. Um, you, can, you can get your headache if you like. And by the way, writing pair is really expert level stuff. Most people get it wrong to start out with. Ugly. It makes near impossible things easy. This is cool. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, basically auto, as we've had for uh, since C++ 11, and I actually first implemented it in AG3, but was forced to take it back out again uh, because of C incompatibilities, um, is the weakest concept. So I could actually define auto with concepts. The concept auto is the one that's always true. So for any type, it'll, it'll bind. So that's fine. Um, yeah, you should be suspicious if they have overly general types. So if I look at void star in a piece of code, I, I worry that the code is bad. And I also know that using void star means that you have neutered the optimizer so your code runs slower. Uh, similarly, now type name is beginning to be a code smell because you haven't said what the type T was supposed to have. You can't write any code with T unless you somehow have an idea about what T does. So write it down. Just like in the voice star, you really should say what, what, uh, what type uh, the, the pointer could be to. And basically auto X is, is nice. I can now call that lambda with any type, except there's very little code that works for every type. So I have to look if it's, if it's real. If I put a, a concept in there instead of that auto, uh, the next guy around can read my code. And most of the time, I'm the next guy around, right? So uh, that's, that's important. And the ideal we have here is plug and play, define high level concepts so that you can uh, have fewer concepts it's not the idea of having absolute the lowest set of criteria for every algorithm, because then if you change the implementation, you have to change the interface. That's not stability. So basically, you have to define your uh, interfaces properly, and then you have freedom of implementation behind that interface, just like for functions. The aim of here is to get us the benefits and the freedoms we have for functions and the uh, flexibility that good interfaces give us. And um, it's not just for algorithms. Here's a definition of an input channel that's in, in, in some fairly key internal uh, mechanism at, at Morgan Stanley. I had to have special permission to, to show this code. But basically, there, this is the way you do, do uh, transport. It has message decoders and input transport channels. It's, um, it's templatized and uh, it's using all kinds of good stuff in uh, C++ uh, 14 and 17. But the point is that the, the specification is precise. And this, the point here being, this is not just a standard library. This is application code. And by the way, it's running today. It's not science fiction I'm talking about. And so there's some concrete suggestions about uh, concepts. Focus your concept designs on semantics. Think about the meaning of the types you're using in generic code. 
if you can't do a really good job of specifying the semantics, do your best and uh, you get some proportional benefits to how good uh, your specification is. This is something that can be introduced gradually, which is really essential for new features in, uh, in a widely used language like C++. Use name concepts. If you can't think of a good name for a concept, it's probably not a good concept. Just like if you can't think of a good name of a function, you probably haven't thought through what that function is for. A lot of the techniques and skills we have built up for functions applies to concepts because after all a concept is a compile time function over types so it's it's the same and you can check things with static asserts because it's compile time and um, use general types to get plug and play and constrain variables with concepts to increase readability and to catch errors early and so my hope here and my expectation, pretty firm expectation, is that concepts will actually change the thing, the way we think about programming and about design, about interfaces and about types. After all, the ultimate aim of language design is to change the way we think about things from something more primitive to something that's more effective. And um, this is not just business as usual this is actually going to change our code and our, the way we, we talk about things. And it'll take time. Okay, that's it. We have plenty of time for questions. <clears throat> you caught me off guard there. I was just reading yeah. some tweets. Keep tweeting, guys. They're awesome. Um, hmm, we have quite some questions. What is your biggest regret when it comes to the roots of C++ design? I, I don't think I have a biggest regrets. I think the major parts of the language are sound. And for every major feature, I could, um, I could improve it with the benefit of hindsight and experience. There's a lot of messy things. I mean, nobody today would define the basic types with conversions both ways from char to double. Uh, this could be fixed, but I don't have a time machine. One of the interesting things about this question, which I think of the time machine question, uh, what if you had a time machine and could go back and fix it? I actually think I could have done concepts and simplified templates if somebody had given me the idea back in 88. But I asked around widely among practitioners, about theoreticians, and nobody could do it. So I didn't have the time machine. All right. Being a living legend, what life advice do you have for the next generations? Oh. <laughs> I no mean, pressure. I mean, my first thought is give me a break. Um, it's easy to give advice, and it's hard to take it. And um, I mean, it's, I mean, try hard, work hard, do good, uh, sort of general stuff. Write it down, guys. Do you think Java or any high-level language will ever be fast enough to replace C++? Uh, first of all, of course, I hope there will be a language that's better than C++. I mean, we want progress, right? And I'm just going to make C++ as hard to beat as I can. And hopefully, if it loses to something else, it'll lose fair and square and the world will have progressed. And no, Java is not going to make it. The Java object model and the virtual machine gets in the way. As long as you have all of those indirections, and as long as you have to do all the stuff at runtime, C++ will win and win big. As long as you can't get down to the hardware properly, um, C++ has a great advantage. The way I see C++ is very simple. It has two parts. It has something that's really good at hardware, and it should keep being really good at hardware. That includes uh, GPUs and FPGAs and the rest of the stuff. 
and caches. And then it has the way of getting away from the hardware so that you don't have to write low-level, unmaintainable CRUD. And that's C++'s domain. And by and large, people have not tried to operate in that domain. They either built very low-level languages or very high-level languages, and that means it leaves C++ alone its domain. There are languages these days that are trying, uh, Rust and Swift, for instance, and we'll see what happens there. I, I would bet on C++. I mean, people have declared C++ dead every year uh, since about 83. Uh, so I've stopped believing in it. We, um, we, 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 we are growing as ever, about 100,000 programmers a year, but that's only a small percentage because we start from a four and a half million base. And so it's, it's growing and yeah, if somebody will, will beat C++ and in speed and elegance and such, let, let, let's hope something like that happens. Challenge accepted. Um, why should we pick C++ over, say, JavaScript? Um, what if you want to write a JavaScript interpreter? They're all written in C++, right? There's a reason for it. Those JavaScript experts are not stupid. Back to this thing, you have to get to the hardware, you have to use the hardware well, and then you have to get above it. Once you've done that, you can have Java and JavaScript and C Sharp and all the C++ applications like that. Cool. Um, would you recommend Rust as an overall superior alternative to C++ for new projects? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, partly because it's not there yet, partly because you do too many uh, annotations on things, and partly because it's not stable enough yet. And again, in a few years, I mentioned it earlier, it's trying in the same domain, but it's not there yet. One of the benefits of something like C and C++ and Fortran, old languages, is that code you wrote 10 years ago will run 10 years from now. A lot of people build things that has to last for decades. And for that, you need stability. That means you need an old language. That means that you have to live with some of the warts of an old language. By the time Rust would be a serious competitor, it will have barnacles too, just like C++. You can't just think that a language grows up, it's perfect, it's, it doesn't have uh, problems, and then go with it. All right. Um, people are curious, what do you do at Morgan Stanley? What do I do at Morgan Stanley? Um, my main job, actually, is to figure out what to do. Um, so I, I help groups with, with, with things. What I help with usually has something to do with the performance, speed, latency. Um, actually, most of it has to do with distributed systems, which I've been working on since my PhD and was actually the origin of C++. And um, in addition to that, I do strange things like work on the C++ uh, standard. I do a bit of education. I was in universities here yesterday talking to the professors. Um, I, uh, what else? I, I teach at Columbia as a, as a public service. Uh, so things like that. Sounds great. Um, what language you consider to be the most elegant? Ah, good question. Elegant for what? If you, if you can restrict your domain to say only math or only uh, database access or, or something like that or only graphics, you can have perfect match between the domain and the language. Therefore, for every domain there is a perfect language that's more, more elegant than C++. Because C++ is a general purpose language, it cannot restrict itself to a, a single domain. So my aim, it was declared specifically way back in the 80s, I want C++ to be second best in this game for everything. So if C++ is the most elegant, it probably has something to do with the hardware. But basically, um, Ba ba basically, domain-specific languages can be and should be the most elegant, and uh, I hope they are implemented in C++. All right. Let's do two more questions. 
Isn't this just interfaces with duck typing? Duck typing? Um, I don't think so. Uh, and this comes back to how do you define interface, how do you define duck typing? Um, the, the, uh, the, it's, it's not just duck typing. It, it's at an interface level where we check properties before we go in and use them. And uh, there's people who call that duck typing because it's not nominal. Uh, I refer to duck typing is when you let the implementation work if the properties are right. I check them at the interface level. That's, that's the main difference there. All right. This question keeps being downvoted and upvoted. What is your opinion on Go language? I don't really have many opinions there. Let's, let's not get into language. Uh, I don't do language comparisons uh, if I can help it. Okay, maybe last one. What would you love to see being removed from C++? Um, C++? C Sharp generics, last time I looked at them, um, what was, was a different kind of abstraction, uh, mostly uh, working at, at the level of, of interfaces and specific functions. Where, where C++ is, is, is just pure predicates, pure predicate logic, and um, it's, it's harder to generate. You, you can say more things in predicate logic that you can say in C sharp interfaces, and it's easier to optimize things. In particular, uh, concepts are really good at implicit conversions and um, combining code from different areas and conversions. Okay, one last one. Can you compare C++ concept and C Sharp generics? Is there a difference in capabilities and or philosophy? So, removed. Uh, that's roughly the same as the first question. Um, and, and basically the answer is, if I had the time machine, I could fix a lot of the details and the language would be much cleaner and much smaller. But I can't do that. It is pointless to fix small things. It's insignificant, and the major parts are in place. If I fix a little thing, I'll annoy 100,000 people, and I don't know where they are. So I don't do that. All right. Thank you very much, guys, for your questions. Let's thank our speaker. Thanks. Thank you.